Hello and welcome back, or welcome if this is your first video. Um, it's great to be sharing with you. Today I'm dipping into some life lessons from Genesis chapters 10 and 11. It's the final part of the first section of the book of Genesis. If you missed any of the earlier videos and you wanted to catch up, you'll find them on the Open Door Church Summary YouTube channel from Friday the 11th of May, Fridays until mid-July, along with loads of other great content uh, for the other days of the week. So do go and have a look if you're uh, if this is your first visit. Uh, I'm looking at Genesis 10 and 11 together because Genesis chapter 10 is pretty much all genealogy. So it's interesting, uh, but not the best material for a devotional video. Uh, the difference from the genealogy before the time of Noah in the earlier parts of Genesis is that uh, many of the names now are recognisable from archaeological discoveries and, and ancient literature. So places like Kittim, Babylon, Akkad, Nineveh, well known to archaeologists and, and people who study the ancient material. Uh, Kush is known to be the area known to the Greeks as, as Nubia in northeast Africa. Mizraim is both the Hebrew and Neo-Babylonian name for Egypt. So a lot of recognisable names and places. We've moved now from prehistory into the historical period, where is where is much more correlation that we can find with other materials and other sources. So in uh, in the midst of this genealogy, a couple of individuals are given special mention. One is a guy called Nimrod, of whom it said he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and that is why it is said, like Nimrod a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centres of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad and Kalni in Shinar. Shinar being Babylonia or Mesopotamia as it is now. So here's a guy who at the time of writing was already a legend uh, and a, a great uh, famous warrior from the past. And Peleg meaning his name meaning division because in his time the earth was divided. The, the significance of these guys and why they're recorded and what's said about them is a bit obscure, but it's possible that both of them may be looking forward to the story that follows in Genesis chapter 11, the story of the Tower of Babel. Uh, so I'm just going to read a few verses from Genesis 11, starting at verse, uh, verse 1, actually, Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, that's Mesopotamia, and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So this is the story of the, the famous Tower of Babel. Uh, Babel being uh, the earlier name for Babylon, as it became, uh, which is very well known to historians and archaeologists. We find a couple of interesting things about their practices. First, they're using bitumen for mortar. Archaeologists confirmed that bitumen was used in that way in Mesopotamia during that period. And there are examples in palaces, temples, ziggurats, including the, the famous palace of King Darius in Susa. And uh, then they used fired bricks. Now, bricks as such have been used since about 6000 BC, but fired bricks, bricks hardened, made of clay hardened in the furnace, were invented in China and they were first used in Mesopotamia about 3000 BC. So a few hundred years before Babylon was founded. They had bricks not, not exactly like this from the good old London Brick Company. There's obviously came from the BBC the Babylon Brick Company, which went bust in about 1000 BC. They tried to get a loan, but the only nearby bank was the Bank of the Euphrates, which obviously wasn't much use. 
yeah, bank, river, get it? Uh, never mind. Bricks and bitumen for mortar. So again, it's interesting to find uh, archaeology confirming some of the things that the Bible says. So what can we learn and what can we see in this passage? Well, first of all, there was a rebellion. God had commanded mankind to spread out and fill the earth. And these guys said, well, let's not do that. Let's not be scattered. Let's gather together and let's make a name for ourselves. So they challenged God's authority and God's commission and purpose for mankind as a race by setting out to build this tower that reaches to the heavens. Now, as we've seen in, in earlier chapters, this is another use of hyperbole, exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. In Deuteronomy, the same phrase, reaching to the heavens, is used by the spies and by God himself to describe the cities of Canaan that they were up against uh, when the Israelites first moved into the land. So not a literal uh, skyscraper, but a description of structures that were monumental and impressive and said something about the builders. So the motivation for building this, we find, is pride. Let's make a name for ourselves. That desire to make a name for ourselves still very much alive in the time that we live in. In his 4th of July speech in 2020, this very year, President Trump referred to the greatest structure on earth, what we have built, the United States of America. Obviously in American accent. And so we find this desire to make a name and to preserve what is. In the 1980s, the white supremacist David Lane said, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Pride and, and preservation in national and ethnic identity has been a powerful mover in human history. And we can see in our own nation the statues and memorials to great persons and great events and achievements of the past, some of which have obviously become highly controversial in recent days because of associations with slavery and other things that we don't like to think about or talk about too much. A guy called Joseph Howe said, a wise nation preserves its records, gathers up its monuments, decorates the tombs of its illustrious dead, repairs its greatest structures and fosters national pride and love of country by perpetual references to the sacrifices and glories of the past. On the other hand, another guy, John Linden, said, I think national pride leads to nothing but wars and hate. And yeah, it's great to be proud and 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 to take pride in our nations, in our communities, you know, to take pride in our streets, in our work, and those kind of things. But nationalism is just the acceptable face of racism. This sense that somehow our nation is greater and, and better than every other nation. No, it's just different. It's just different. Take, take pride in who we are, sure. But don't ever think yourself or your nation or your race or your community better than some other. And what we find is that this leads to futility. We have a saying, don't we, that pride comes before a fall. They set out to build a tower that reaches the heavens, but they fall short, and God comes down to intervene in their ambitions. Ambition is a, is a good thing up to a point. It's a great incentive, but it can also be a recipe for disappointment. We're told, aren't we, you can do anything you want to do. You can achieve anything you set out to. Well, I wonder how many singers, how many actors, how many footballers and, and other sportsmen are grafting away on low salaries because they believed in that. They could achieve whatever they wanted to. They could become great as as humanity wrongly measures greatness. In every competitive arena, everyone wants to sit at the top table, but there are never enough places. Contrast the attitude of Winston Churchill, who said, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. I like that as one who's had a few failures. Failure is part of life. We learn through failure as well as by success. James, in his letter in the New Testament, said, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, 
but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. The quality of our life is not measured by our achievement, but the quality of our character and of our faith. Reach as high as you want. Go for it. But understand that you may not reach it. The higher you reach, the higher you'll get, for sure. But you are not guaranteed everything that you dreamed of. And eventually you will have to learn both humility and contentment in what God has given you. But then thirdly, we learn the value and importance of togetherness and of community and working together. The God, the God said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible to do for them. We can accomplish so much more together than we can apart. If we set out with a single mind and a single purpose, each of us uh, setting aside some of our own personal ambition for the sake of our community, of our nation. What we're, going, what we're being asked to do in COVID, to, to set aside some of our freedoms to protect the more vulnerable amongst us. If we do that, we can achieve so much more than we could as individuals. President Harry, Harry S. Truman said this, and I finish with this, because I think it's a great quote. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who takes the credit. Are you in it? Are you in life? Are you in it for yourself as an individual or as part of a community, a community of faith, a community of purpose, a community who are caring for and loving each other so that you can accomplish so much more and be a part of something so much greater than you could ever build in your own? Something that is not based on glory and greatness and success as so many people measure it, but something that is based on the quality of our lives as individuals and our lives together, on love and grace and mercy and kindness and all of the things that the New Testament teaches us and that we value. So let me just pray in closing. Father, help us not to be <coughs> influenced by the values, the rebellion, the pride of the society that surrounds us. Help us not to aim our lives at mere personal glory, but, Father, to seek the good of the community, the good of those around us, to value character, to value love and mercy and kindness above other things. Amen.